thank Edwin, as always, for making this place what it is, the Misano experience, and for having uh, brought me here in the first place. Um, I'm very sorry that I missed last week, and especially in Naomi's, in Naomi Seidman's lectures, as I think they would have been very useful for me, as I'm sure they were for you, to think questions of uh, translation and conversion. I think the theme of conversion is fascinating and extremely promising for translation. Um, we think of conversion in relation to translation, translation in order to convert. I think um, that's at the origin of why we're here, here at the NIDA school. That was, that was NIDA's uh, project, um, among other things. And uh, that's Vince's uh, work as well, fascinating work on how translation uh, works in the effort to convert. But there are other ways to think about translation and conversion and um, having to do with the self-image of the translator and what side the translator is on. So for some people you can say that conversion is the opposite of translation. When you translate you get to have your cake and eat it too. So you have your original and you have the translation and those two coexist side by side. Whereas conversion is a toppling over, a toppling over into another uh, realm and it's sort of excessive translation if you want. Uh, the translator loses her footing and she falls into the other camp. She no longer maintains that stance somewhere in the middle. And um, uh, in my book on Montreal I talk about one character in particular named Malcolm Reed who is a translator in Montreal in the 1960s who starts out as a translator and he actually physically moves from the city of Ottawa to the city of Montreal which is moving east and he translates across the city but as the years go on he becomes so enamored of his new culture that he actually converts to it and then he moves further east and he sets up shop he lives in Quebec City and that's where he's been living ever since. So this is a true story. It just so happens to, you know, there is this trajectory. He moved in one direction and he kept on going in that direction and that direction took him into the other culture and took him from, this, from the place of the translator to something else, to someone who has uh, taken up residence in that new reality. Um, and we think of, of course, religious conversion as, um, as an activity of self-transformation. So how is it that the I becomes something else? How is the I... When you convert, when you choose a different reality, are you becoming something other or are you becoming closer to yourself? Are you becoming a better, a better exemplar of what you truly are? Or are you becoming something different? And I think this is very much a translation question. Uh, does translation bring you... Madame de Stael thought that translation was a way that, you trans, that nations became better versions of themselves through translation. They became better nations because they integrated translation. And they, in a sense, converted. Um, conversion has a... Um, there's a relationship between conversion and confession. Exactly what that relationship is, I would like to investigate uh, further, not, not here, but uh, because I, I don't have the opportunity to do that here, but um, the confession has always been a genre uh, which has fascinated me, um, and the, the confession as a way of, of speaking about a former and a future self. Right? The confession is, I was this, but now I am this. That's the, the, the classic form of it. Uh, one of the most wonderful confessions that I know is the confession that is um, in a novel by Italo Svevo called La Coscienza di Zeno. Um, it's an Italian novel which has been variously translated as the confessions of Zeno or the conscience of Zeno. 
conscience and confession uh, go together. And it's a confession which takes place, of course, on the psychoanalyst's divan, uh, on the sofa of the psychoanalyst. And so, uh, but it's done under co coercion. The psychoanalyst orders him to do this. So confessions, there's this idea that confession and conversion can come sometimes from within, sometimes from without. So as we know, translation can be freely undertaken or translation can also be um, a result of coercion. So these are areas that um, are, are, are very, very suggestive and very interesting, I think, for, for translation studies. What I'm going to talk about today, though, um, is conversion as it relates to place. So place which is converted through translation, through place, uh, through the translation of place names. So um, I s now begin this. So on a recent trip to Hong Kong, walking through the shopping area of Tsim Sa Choi, which, with its giant pulsing advertising signs, I gradually became aware of an array of faces I hadn't seen until then in my short stay in the city. Clustered in groups, talking or standing about, there were people I later found described as African entrepreneurs, Indian temporary workers, African and South Asian asylum seekers, and penurious travelers from across the globe. Hong Kong has always been a cosmopolitan city, and so diversity itself is not remarkable. But there was clearly a special buzz on this bit of street, different in feeling from the movement of tourists and shoppers. The reason, I discovered, was the presence around the corner of Chongqing Mansions, a dilapidated 17-story structure full of cheap guest houses and cut-rate businesses in the midst of Hong Kong's tourist district. I, I was able to learn about this astonishing place in detail in a book by Gordon Matthews, who calls it the most globalized building in the world. The building is that any, any of you know Hong Kong, know this building? Okay, I'll be interested in your uh, reactions. The building is the headquarters of traffic in all kinds of goods as they transit between mainland China, Hong Kong, and destinations such as Dubai, Lagos, Mombasa, Nairobi, Bangkok, and Kolkata. It contains shop after shop of cell phones, gems, kitchen products, clothing, furniture. It also houses a maze of apartments, cheap tourist rooms, and restaurants. Matthews calls it a center of low-end globalization indeed a microcosm showing patterns of trade and migration, highly sensitive to changes the, in the economy, most importantly, the demise of the counterfeit cell phone trade due to the advent of the iPhone, and revealing patterns of translation. The model trader might be a Tanzanian trader who travels to Hong Kong for a week to source a few hundred used phones imported from Europe, refabbed over the border in Shenzhen, specially packaged to disguise their counterfeit batteries and then brought back to Africa as extra luggage. His tiny room costs less than $20 a night and the trip nets him $400 to $1,300 if nothing goes wrong. He makes multiple trips a month. But the long-term prospects of such, buying, uh, of such commerce as fr are fragile for many reasons, including the possibility of mainline Chinese buying out the building, the transition from the counterfeit Phone, counterfeit phone trade to the smartphone era. Matthews analyzes the economy of the place and shares the conversations of his many years as an observer, telling the stories of those who carry the goods back to their homes, like the camel caravans or the merchant ships of yore. English is the lingua franca of the mansions, but many other languages swirl through this giant market. There are both vehicular languages, such as Hindu-Urdu for South Asians, or French and Swahili for Africans. But as Matthews notes, language usage is fascinatingly nested in Chongqing mansions, with different speakers finding the closest and most intimate language in which they can speak. <laughs> 
Africans delighting when they find another speaker of Hausa or Luo, just as speakers of Punjabi and Bengali communicate, while to some extent ignoring their fellow South Asians. Occasionally, a common language among traders could be Japanese or Swedish, if they have both spent some time in these countries. Many of the traders operate in several languages, and during the moments of the worst criminal violence in the building, the head of the ownership committee put out leaflets in different languages, Urdu, Hindi, French, Nepali, asking residents to report crime. Chunking Mansions is multilingual, but it, it is also translational. The mix of voices which the outsider captures as Babylon is in fact a chorus of conversations whose nature will change just as the wares of the building vary with the transformation of technologies. So Chunking Mansions stands as a model of a translation site, a space of accelerated language traffic, of heightened language awareness. As Matthews demonstrates, it is a place whose meaning is constructed through the commercial exchanges that take place there, but also through the narratives that nourish them, the trajectories of the traders, their motivations, their implications in specific communities, the circuits of exchange which they choose to engage in. While the building projects the image of a free market, a haven of unbridled capitalism, in fact, the traders are trapped in a web of constraints that range from the channels imposed by the historical roots of colonial trade to Hong Kong's visa regulations and the changing trade relations between China and Hong Kong. <clears throat> the building okay, is also defined from the outside as a strange, mysterious, and dangerous place. On another walk, my companion a mainland Chinese studying in Hong Kong, pointed out the building to me as a place of ill fame, a place people in Hong Kong were afraid of. It was coded foreign, an island of strangeness, a universe not accessible to the otherwise frenetic flow of exchange and consumption in the city. As Matthews points out at the outset, Chunking Mansions is located right in the very heart of the glitziest part of Hong Kong, some of the most expensive property in the world. And this is what makes its reputation as a heart of darkness so extraordinary. So while Chunking Mansions is part of an immense circuit of exchange and commerce worldwide, it is paradoxically cut off from the very place of which it is a physical part. It is both within and outside the culture of Hong Kong. For this reason, the building is sometimes compared to the now demolished Kowloon walled city, a largely ungovernable, densely populated enclave in Kowloon City. While this situation, which no longer exists, while this situation is changing somewhat today, for a long time, Chunking Mansions lay outside the conversation of Hong Kong as a rogue space, a zone of incalcitrance. And so the translational aspect of the building did not necessarily extend to all participants in the civic conversation. So the translational nature of the building also includes aspects of non-translation, of resistance and refusal, of hostility and indifference. The building is spectacular, is a spectacular by its dimensions, example of a site or place that is host to activities of language exchange, but also whose identity and cultural meaning are constructed through processes of translation. This is my subject today. And my principal example will be, if I get to it, <laughs> the built heritage of the city, um, and in particular on Montreal. But the project of which this talk is a part will include, eventually, sites and structures like airports and train stations, towers and bridges, hotels and libraries, markets and checkpoints. My question is, in what ways are public spaces produced through language and translation? Globalization has intensified the imbrication of close and distant. Translators no longer need to cross oceans or traverse continents in order to instruct themselves in cultural difference. <clears throat> 
spaces of diversity are now increasingly found at home, on whatever continent that home is found. And so the carrying across of translation happens across the small distances of cities, neighborhoods, households, just as it has always resided in the physical spaces opened by the encounters among peoples. While the translator works with words that emerge from printed pages and screens, the forces brought to bear on the translator's task charge these energies with the charge these words with the energies of busy streets, border areas, and contact, contact zones. <clears throat> okay, my goal is to draw attention to the physical spaces of our daily life as a product of translation processes and translation histories. This is to shift perspective away from the journey of the individual translator and away from the idea that translation takes place only in the pages of books to the spaces and structures that shape interlinguistic encounters and to the role that languages and interlingualism have in defining place. So there's a whole literature now about space and place and especially about place and how narrative shapes place but language is conspicuously absent from that, uh, from that uh, discussion. And I think it makes absolutely, <laughs> it makes very easy sense to inject translation into uh, this discussion. Place comes into being through narrative. Language is crucial to the construction of social and cultural space. And translation highlights the conflicts and dissonant claims over social space. The spaces to be considered are those which physically house activities of translation, also those which symbolically call up these activities or which historically bear the memory of language exchange. And here's where I speak specifically about conversion. Spaces such as I've already looked at in my book on cities in Calcutta, for instance, the town hall of Calcutta, now Kolkata, the city having been itself translated, that town hall, which was once an expression or the showcase of British power and splendor, is now a, a symbol, a very strong symbol of Bengali nationalism. In Nicosia, the Gothic church of St. Sophia converted into a mosque. Well, we have many, many examples of such conversions of religious buildings, uh, which are uh, converted from uh, churches to mosques. Uh, back and forth, uh, much more frequent than we might think once you start uh, collecting the examples. They're very frequent. The one in Nicosia is particularly interesting because it's a Gothic church with a minaret on top. I think perhaps the only one in the world, and <laughs> if you have any counterexamples, because you usually see sort of Byzantine-style churches, like St. Sophia in Istanbul, which with a minaret, and that looks like a mosque. But look, think of, a, think of your neighborhood um, Gothic church in, in the United States with a mosque on top, a uh, minaret. It, 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 it strains the imagination a little bit. Another example, which I'm going to discuss in a moment, is um, the, the conversion of sites like, um, for instance, in Prague, which was once a German Czech city. Um, has had two opera houses. There was the German National Opera and the Czech Opera. And the German National Opera was converted into a second Czech Opera. So the, it's, the German um, is con converted. Uh, but before I uh, go uh, return to these, this question of buildings and the built heritage and how built heritage can be converted, just a few moments on questions of space and translation. So space became an important preoccupation of translation studies under the influence of the intellectual frameworks of the 1980s. So translation studies came into being, we can say, at the same time as theories of post-structuralism and post-colonialism and feminism were at their height or uh, had reached a certain kind of uh, prominence. Bo these powerful strains of thinking, it, but specifically post-structuralism, shifted attention away from temporality to what Doreen Massey called the new spatial times, 
in reference to the widely accepted idea that mid 20th century modes of thought had displaced history as the master code of interpretation. This displacement by emphasizing the traffic of globalization against the backdrop of the profound power imbalances of colonialism also drew attention to sites of inquiry seeking to displace and decenter Europe on the global map. So the birth of the discipline of translation studies was very much influenced by this preoccupation with space. Breaking with a long humanist tradition on the one hand and with positive attempts to positivist attempts to view text as abstract linguistic entities subject to pure descriptive analysis, translation studies defined its object as worldly texts acting within cultural, political, and economic relations. Far from being a simple matter of contrastive linguistics, translation was now regarded as a complex intercultural process for which the contexts of communication became of foremost importance. The very specific circumstances of translation, defined as broadly as possible, from the actual physical location and the circumstances of the translator to national and institutional frameworks, to the historic and epistemological natures of the discourses in question, all these engage the idea of space as an analytic factor. Just as they broaden the idea of translation, so that translation becomes what, what one might say a conversation which takes place at the intersection of languages. That's my kind of working definition of translation. The spatial turn, we could say, also turned attention to the location from which theory itself issues. Geography influences the ideas and values that are brought to translation studies. That translation theory was a special concern for politically marginalized countries acknowledge the reality of the spaces which carry the burden of translation. This, and acknowledge that many parts of the globe were neglected in the study of translation flows with the little information on the history of major tra translating traditions outside Europe or North America. More recently has come a realization of very, very partial understanding of the spaces that translations occupy outside of the formal economy and structures of understanding fostered by the discipline. And so translation spaces have come to stand, for instance, Cobus Mare, I'm, who, I just, who I'm quoting, uh, makes the point that it's important to, translate, to explore translation activity, he and, and, a, and a group of other scholars, uh, activity which stands outside the traditional purview of academia, that is the translation of the informal economy, for instance, non-professional translation. Um, and of particular importance in this sort of idea of space is the notion of translation zone, which I think is a term you're familiar with from Emily Apter, but also used by others, term that was originally um, belong, proposed by uh, Mary Louise Pratt. Um, and the idea of the zone um, uh, focusing on spaces that are not national. So getting away from the very, very long and ingrained tradition of translation as being an international activity. And we know that translation breaks down into many, many other categories. Um, important in, in this context, for instance, is Michael Cronin's idea of microcosmopolitanism which points to the complexity inherent in small local spaces. So small spaces, local spaces are just as complex, contain as many layers of translation as, as large ones. Um, and, and an emphasis of translation in situations of conflict, again, very spatially oriented, has resulted in an impressive spike in research in specific areas for instance, courtrooms, military institutions, Nazi concentration camps, the conference rooms of Cold War diplomacy, refugee camps, the political spaces of dissent such as Tahrir Square. So a lot of recently, a lot of wonderful and important work on small spaces as they express 
um, large, <laughs> large dilemmas of, of translation. Okay, so I'd like to now go on to talk about, in particular, about the translation of the built heritage as it traverses linguistic regimes and is shaped by them. So I propose that architectural forms can be considered languaged when they come to be associated with specific languages, either at the time of their construction or through changes that link them to regimes of meaning and memory. Buildings, the built heritage, is tied to the social and cultural conditions which bring them into being and which frame their existence through time. Sometimes this languaging is explicit through chiseled inscriptions or other practices of naming, but the association with language can also be cultural and historical. When one language regime supplants another, then streets, monuments, buildings can be said to be translated. Um, Saxa locunter was a Roman saying, often invoked in later ages to refer to the messages that must be deciphered from the vestiges of an ancient past. Saxa locunter stones speak and their meaning must be explored and relearned. These words were invoked in the conflictual context of early 20th century debates around the real language of a city's stones. For instance, from the 1880s onwards, the stones of the multilingual cities of Central Europe were increasingly a subject of contested ownership. For instance, as Prague was undergoing its transformation from a German Habsburg to a Czech city at the turn of the century, the Bohemian historian Julius Lippert imagines the old stones crying out, Pilgrim, think of it. I am a Czech stone. Don't try to translate me. But in fact, the historian is being ironic because in his mind, he knows that the true language is German. For this historian, Prague is a German city and he doesn't want the stones to be talking Czech. He clings to the version of the city before it became Czech. These political debates gave, right, gave rise to outright violence in the course of two world wars, which saw the languages of the city's stones dictated by military victory. When the German city of Breslau was transformed literally overnight into a Polish city in 1945, the dissonance, we haven't got there yet. I don't, I'll, we're getting there soon. Anybody recognize this? This is, the, uh, this is Barcelona. This is the Palau de la Musica in Barcelona. Very, this, is, this is a building that speaks Catalan, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. When the German city of Breslau was transformed literally overnight into a Polish city in 1945, the dissonance between the German style architecture, or what was left of it in a ruined landscape, and the new identity of the city was particularly acute. The refugees who took over this city, many of, the, of them Poles who had lost their own homeland to Ukraine, were people desperate not only to be Polish themselves, but to believe that everything and everyone around them was purely Polish. They belonged to the generation which proclaimed that every stone in Wroclaw speaks Polish. That's a quote from a history of the city. So I've long been fascinated uh, uh, um, there are some novels about these situations at the end of World War I where literally overnight one population would be hauled out and a new population would arrive. I've, I've, I never figured out how people chose the houses they came to live in or whether they just kind of walked up and said, I'll take this one. But that was kind of what happened in 1945 in, in Breslau, which was very hugely ruined. It was, it was very, uh, but, but the city overnight, um, the German population was driven out and a Polish population, which itself had been driven out of 
the city of Lvov in Ukraine, which became Ukrainian, was kind of shipped in and walked in the next morning. So this is, it kind of boggles the imagination, but this is one of the most extreme examples of a, of a conversion of a city uh, from one language regime to another. It corresponds, of course, to the end of Second World War, which was a very disastrous uh, moment uh, for, for the Germans. So the translation of the city was endorsed by a war-weary and desperate population anxious to believe in the political transformation of a ruined city and by the forcible expulsion of these German speakers who might have continued to believe in the Germanness of their town. So they were gone. Streets and shop signs were painted over, place names changed, German libraries pillaged, monuments demolished, inscriptions, some of them very old, erased from churches and other buildings. The German language itself had to be abolished. So the city became, went from Breslau to Wroclaw. Uh, many other cities of Central Europe experienced this kind of remake or conversion, but um, uh, in different ways. They were, and they were also translated in many cases out of their multilingualism to become monolingual national capitals. And perhaps cities that have experienced language remakes are condemned to a perpetual state of dissonance, their surfaces forever troubled by spectral layers of memory. So in the context of linguistic rivalries and emerging nationalist ideologies, particular architectural styles are explicitly linked to language. Now I'm going back just briefly to the end of the 19th century in Europe where linguistic nationalism, Czech, Finnish, Catalan, and many more, made an explicit appeal to the historical Renaissance period to support the reactivation of their literary and political cultures. Architecture in Barcelona, as in Prague, used Renaissance references in order to make a link between buildings and language. The Palau de la Musica in Barcelona was originally built for the famous choral society called Orfeo Catalan, which in the beginning of the 20th century was leading a cultural awakening in Catalonia. It was inaugurated in 1908. The design of the palace follows the Catalan Art Nouveau style. Dominic y Montana, Montaner gave much creative freedom to the craftsmen and artisans who were carving the famous and detailed facade of the building, providing a special, typical Catalan prof profile associated with the palace. The decoration motifs and even the mode of construction of the building was tightly linked to Catalonia, its culture and language. The Czech National Theatre was also built as a monument to an emerging culture, using the idiom of the Renaissance to refer to the history and aspirations of the Czech people, a cathedral of national rebirth. The theatre was built as a counterpart to the German institutions of the city and involved civic partic participation for the funding and promotion of the building and as an expression of newly patriotic community identifying with an idealized fantasy of the past. So these two buildings coexisted. The first, the, uh, the German was there. This one was built as the explicit counterpart, but Prague having become a Czech city, this is the building which was translated. This is the building which is converted. So what was originally a, um, Wagner was inaugurated with Wagner's operas, it was a German language uh, uh, opera, it became uh, a Czech opera. The other one, I, I'm not, um, with, with s slightly uh, different uh, uh, vocations. And just uh, uh, and another example here, of, of course, of many that I could. This is the th city of Thessaloniki, which was um, destroyed by fire in 1971. Thessaloniki was a uh, was a, um, an Ottoman city, 
which had uh, Ladino, uh, Turkish, Greek, any number of languages, a very multilingual and cosmopolitan city until 1912. Um, then there were the Balkan Wars, uh, the first Balkan War, and uh, the city itself was converted into a Greek language city um, in, um, in 1912 or 1915, maybe 12% of the population spoke Greek. By 1925, it was a Greek language city. But because it had also had a fire, it was um, rebuilt, rebuilt in this, in this style which is called Neo-Byzantine. And the Neo-Byzantine style was re meant to refer to everything that was not Turkish. That Neo-Byzantine equals not Ottoman, right? Erasing, trying to erase the Ottoman past, reach back to the Greek, the Byzantine origins of the city, to rebrand the city, not only linguistically, but architecturally. And Salonika, or former Salonika, which became Thessaloniki, is probably the city that is the most, the clearest example of a converted city, because not only was it linguistically converted, it was converted uh, on, the, on the basis of its architectural plan, to the extent that the city plan that, uh, that pre-existed, which was uh, the, where the center of the city was largely Jewish, with many synagogues in the center of the city, is no longer even traceable. Those streets, those streets don't exist anymore. So that's the opposite of, for instance, Warsaw, which was rebuilt after the war as an absolute replica of itself, right? The same, exactly the same. In fact, what's really fascinating in Warsaw is when you, I, I, is when you walk down the street, they have, they have photos in front of the building of what the building was, but the photo is to show you that the building was rebuilt copying the photo. So it's a city which is totally identical to its former self. So the photo represents the original, is the photo, and the city um, was rebuilt as a replica of itself, whereas Thessaloniki is built as a converted city, right? It's, so rebuilding does not necessarily mean changing. It depends very much on this, the kind of dynamics um, that we're talking about. Um, I could go on to Montreal, but give me an idea of how long you'd like me to... Uh, I, well, I still some of your time, so I, I, it's 15, 20 more minutes. Okay. Um, All right. Great. So, I'd just like to talk briefly about Montreal, which is my city, because um, of, of the idea that the city itself, as a... Um, Rather than a converted city, a city in a state of tension between a, a double architectural past, a double linguistic regime, and a double architectural past. So yet, there are examples of conversion within that. So let me just give you a brief idea. Um, in particular, what I want to draw attention to when I'm talking to Montreal about Montreal is so what I presented so far is, okay, a language converted to another, some, some sort of cataclysm that is responsible for a translation. But probably much more typical is a city like Montreal where we're not talking about cataclysm, one moment of translation, but a long history of tensions. And so what I want to draw attention to, because I'm familiar with, with this history, are the different kinds of flows across the city, which account for the tensions which, which result in the translations or not. So that may not, uh, let me explain. So the history of Montreal since the 1960s and what is known as the Quiet Revolution has been one of progressive translation from English into French. So this was a, a double city. Um, always in tension, you could say, from the very beginning. So a, a city of double colonization. It's quite interesting because we're now celebrating a very, very momentous 
occasion, the 375th anniversary of the, I'm momentous is in, in the scare quotes because 375 is a fairly obscure number. However, we're having a big do this summer because it's the 375th anniversary of the city. Um, using all you know, the latest technology, Moment Factory, I don't know how many of you are familiar with you know, Montreal's very high tech and creativity and we just lighting up the bridge and spectacle and, uh, and all kinds of stuff, uh, presumably to attract you to come and visit. So please do. So uh, Montreal is a city of uh, double colonization. Okay, first there was First Nations, Camp, camps and, and towns. Then came uh, the French, who colonized, called it Ville Marie. And then came the British in, 19, in 1759, who conquered the French. Sounds like the house that Jack built. Uh, who conquered the French, who uh, then made it into a British city. But what is fascinating about the city and what makes it a beautiful city is that you have layers of architecture which are linguistically and nationally connoted. So you have a first layer of French colonial architecture followed by another layer of English, British colonial architecture. And those layers are in uh, conversation and what has followed over the years has been a succession of linguistically connoted structures. So gray stone is British, yellow brick is French. I'll show you some, some, some. and uh, uh, this architectural rivalry, rivalry is very much a continuation of the linguistic rivalry. Okay, so the, from the 1960s on, the overwhelming narrative of Quebec history as well as Montreal history is a translation from a predominantly English city, not necessarily numbers-wise, but econ economy-wise, to a French city. So Montreal is now, and I declare it, and I say it, Montreal is a francophone city, right? But my declaring it, I mean, doesn't necessarily make it true. <laughs> it's, it's almost an ideological uh, declaration because numbers are always, uh, the, the, the global power of English being what it is, English has, will always have, uh, have some influence. Okay, so, um, uh, from the 60s on, we're talking about a francophone reconquest of Montreal. Uh, and I'm very, uh, these slides are of various quality. Um, a francophone monument, a, an anglophone one, sorry for this. Uh, this is the, the Queen Elizabeth Hotel and it became a very uh, um, important uh, let's say symbolic uh, place, especially during the 1960s uh, when it was built as an English language monument to Queen Elizabeth uh, with no reference to French at all. Then there was just a small, you know, add-on there, Le Reine Elizabeth. Anybody who knows French will wonder why it's Le Reine Elizabeth, and most everybody does, because it's the hotel is a Le and Reine Elisabeth is the name of it. So it's called Le Reine Elisabeth, um, which is bizarre. Um, so, um, yeah. So Montreal has a double architectural heritage, the French colonial era buildings. So there you have Fairmount Le Reine Elisabeth. Sorry for the blurry. Um, this is old Montreal, the French colonial style buildings. Um, the vernacular style in Montreal, uh, even smaller. Uh, old Montreal again. This is just behind Old Montreal. Now we're into British commercial. This is British, uh, one block away from that is that, just behind it, okay? I'll leave that for a second. Okay, so uh, the Victorian business district which rises a few blocks behind it. Similarly, the city is dotted with competing institutional styles. The venerable Greystone of McGill University, 
the upstart yellow brick and deco style of Université de Montréal, built in the 1930s. So this was a riposte, right? You've got greystone, we've got yellow brick. That, and we've got modernism, with a reference to French, France, um, Beaux-Arts style. This Place Ville-Marie went up in the 1960s as Montreal's first signature skyscraper in the international style, financed by English money, English and American money, even if it was called Place Ville-Marie, which was a very, very contested name, also for various reasons, um, the, which I won't explain, but uh, followed by the riposte, it's gray, it's true, it's not yellow, but it's gray, <laughs> but it's a different style. Place des Jardins was a repast. This, it was, um, ex the, its identity expressed through location, it's in the East End, but it was the symbol of uh, Caisse des Jardins, a very important uh, a financial institution in Quebec. It's, it comes out of uh, a, a social tradition of uh, a mutual lending, and uh, it's, uh, it, is um, the, um, this is the building which is uh, uh, Place des Jardins. So the struggle for meaning um, also concerns symbolic structures like the cross atop Mount Royal. So is this a religious reference to the Francophone Catholic past of Montreal or has the cross been translated into something different? Well, I would argue that it has been translated into a more kind of an exhausted, lying down structure. This is a sculpture that was um, from the, actually from the 1960s that has recently been uh, replaced uh, on the streets of Montreal for a short time um, by, by, by a Quebec sculptor of the, uh, of the 1960s. And I think that expresses some of the reality of what the cross, which this is a, uh, proudly stands on the top of Mount Royal, uh, the symbol of the city, um, but uh, this is what it has become. A, a bedside lamp, uh, uh, an, an exhausted and uh, uh, powerless uh, symbol uh, of Montreal today. Okay, um, briefly, I'm just going to give uh, five uh, categories. Um, of forces that have that result that that have an impact on these uh, translational moments in um, in Montreal. So, if I could, I would propose a series of five maps that illustrate these. I mean, it's it's actually a project in the future which I would like to do, which is draw these five maps. But uh, let me just talk about five forces that are at work in the translational um, nature of the city. So, one, re-territorialization. Re so, translation as a way of re-territorializing the city. So, French moving from the east side of Montreal to the English side, taking over the territory gradually through branding, through uh, signage, through um, institutional uh, situation, through acts of translation, language re-territorializing the city so that what were English language spaces become French language spaces. Two, rerouting. So, Translation doesn't always go in the same directions. Immigrant languages originally, in, for most of the 20th century, immig immigrant languages were translated into English. That was the strong language. It was also the cultural zone. Um, immigrant languages were classified in some way as outside of the French language community. That is totally changing. So now immigrant languages have been rerouted uh, towards French. And that includes former immigrant languages. For instance, Yiddish, which belonged to the mm, 
English Jewish experience of Montreal, Yiddish language writings are increasingly translated into French as an expression of the fact that the, that immigrant experience belongs to, now belongs to the city as a whole. It's no longer property. Third, which languages are absent? Okay, so there's an absenting, if I'm going to use, and we can talk about First Nations languages, for instance, as absent from the conversation. Or heard in a whisper, but largely absent. Um, mixing, what happens in border zones, what lungs in translation sites, the idea of mixing, translanguaging in its many aspects um, is a, uh, a force that, um, that drives translation. And finally, uh, refusing. So the view of a translational city would not be complete without the inclusion of sites of resistance to translation, zones of non-translation, um, and I don't think um, I have to elaborate. These are, uh, uh, you know, zones of intolerance, uh, zones of uh, violence, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Montreal and Quebec has seen uh, some rather spectacular and, uh, and tragic moments of such violence and intolerance. So, in conclusion, these mappings of Montreal translational flows and the marks they leave on urban space are a way of beginning to examine which languages count in civic dialogue and how the city is marked by public language. This more complex understanding of translation flows and the logic of circulation also reminds us of chunking mansions in Hong Kong and it, the conflicting affects which it inspires, not only of celebration of international trade or nostalgia for a richer past, but also emotions of fear and, and, and hostility. So all these um, affects um, are part of our understandings of the way language shapes uh, public space in the city. Thank you.